We begin chapter one with a definition of statistics. Statistics is the branch of mathematics concerned with the collection analysis and interpretation of data for presentation and decision-making purposes. A lot of people usually think that statistics is just about the mean, median, and mode, and about bar graphs, and bar charts, and pie charts, but there's a whole lot more to this. Yes, in this first chapter, we're gonna talk about collection of data and sampling of data, but quite honestly, the analysis and the interpretation is gonna be coming in the next couple chapters after that. And it's really the decision making that's the power of this course that's gonna to come towards the second half of this class. Now, there are two types of statistics. The first type is descriptive statistics. That's what most people think of, consisting of organizing, summarizing, and graphically representing information or data in a clear and effective way. This is what most people think of when we are talking about statistics. Now, some examples include charts, tables, and calculations such as percentages and averages. This will be stuff that we are covering basically in chapters two and three. Most of our course, however, is gonna be about inferential statistics, which consists of methods of drawing conclusions. There's our decision-making. Drawing conclusions about a population based on information obtained from a sample of the population. Now you are used to the word estimation where you give an educated guess. Now that's something I want you to have an understanding of as we go through this course, but really the scientific method is the hypothesis test, which is the whole second half of this course where we test a claim about a population. Now I've got two vocabulary words over here at the right that are with us for the entire semester. The population, that's just not people, okay? We could talk about the population of the United States or of another country, but it could be a population of items also, and it's what we are going to be studying. Now, a sample is a group of subjects or items that are selected from the population. Consider it to be a subset. If you want to learn something about a population, you choose a representative or hopefully representative sample from that population to represent them. Let's pretend our population is the state of California. We are going to choose sample people or items from within the state of California. We're not going to be choosing sample values from the state of Nevada or Utah to represent California, the sample needs to be a subset of the population itself. Now, the sampling methods on how you draw the samples, that is a key part of this first chapter of the course. We begin by talking about a bunch of different types of sampling. The first method is simple random sampling, and often it's gonna be abbreviated as SRS where each possible sample of a given size is equally likely to be the one selected. Now the words equally likely are really the two key words. If you are trying to decide what type of sampling is being illustrated in an example, that is exactly what you go to. You ask that question whether every item in that population has an equal chance of being selected into that sample. Um, you might think of this as drawing names out of a hat. If you were to take slips of paper, write everybody's name on it that you wanted to be part of your population, shuffle it all up and randomly pick with your eyes closed from that hat, that would be a simple random sample because everyone would have an equal chance of representation. Now, I want you to know the advantages and disadvantages of each of these different types of sampling methods. As far as our simple random sampling, it is the best method. It is what we strive for, and it's the easiest to perform. And I put sometimes 
Now, the reason I say sometimes is if we randomly select a group of people out of a population and we're not able to get in contact with them for getting their input on something, and I'm talking about surveys here, then we have to keep going back to them over and over and over to attempt to reach them to get their input. And that's what makes it difficult. We can't just say, oh, we can't reach them and move on to somebody else. We need to go specifically to them because they were the ones that were chosen at random. Now, disadvantages, it may be difficult to actually find a truly random samples for the reason I just described above. Now, one key topic that I wanna discuss right here at the beginning of the course is the difference between random sampling and random assignment. Often in this course, you're gonna see the word random and automatically say, oh, random is random. But there's different ways we can use the word random. Now, when we deal with random sampling, that's what I described a little bit ago, where you've got a hat, or in this case, a fishbowl with a bunch of names in it, you shuffle them all up, and you choose from, keyword from, that population of names, a name to be drawn. That is choosing out of the population. Random assignment is usually done in an experiment sort of a situation where you've got a group of people and you are randomly assigning subjects into a treatment group. For example, I've got treatment A and treatment B in this picture. Let's say we're testing out a drug to determine if it is effective in helping to cure people. You can't just give everybody the new drug. What you need to do is you need to have a control group as far as in to compare with. So you have a test group and a control group, and you can't just put anybody into either group. You want to make sure that there is a random assignment into each of those groups. Otherwise, bias might be introduced. For example, if we're looking at uh, a diet exercise, a diet type of program, and you have more overweight people in the test group, well, it, it, it reasons that those people have more to lose weight wise. Therefore, it may appear that that group is more of that drug is more effective than the control group alone, but it's just based on who was put into those groups. And that's why we're talking about this random assignment, making sure that both groups, the test group and the control group are composed similarly. Now, random sampling is taking out of the population, so to speak, and think of random assignment as putting people into groups instead of taking them out of. Right now in this chapter, actually for the first half of this course, we're only going to be dealing with this random sampling. But later on in this course, second half of the course, this second idea of random assignment becomes a key issue. And that's why I like to introduce it right now so that when we do need it in our hypothesis testing at the end of the course, you have this concept already in your head. And you will see these pictures again later in the course. So method number one, simple random sampling is the best method of sampling there is. Now we contrast that with the worst method of sampling, which is the sample of convenience. And this is just based on the people that are available to be studied. This might be where you stand outside of Walmart and wait for people to come to you to gather your data. You're not making any effort to get good representation. Now advantages, yes, it's easy to perform. It's easy to just stand outside of Walmart it's time saving and it's cost efficient because in a short amount of time, you can gather all of your data. But disadvantages, wow, it is the worst method as I mentioned already and people have no chance, some people have no chance of being sampled. Now, by the way, as you are watching my video lectures, I'm assuming that you're going to be hitting the pause button every once in a while. So I'm going to just keep on going with my lectures and you feel free to pause away and rewind as needed. 
Let's move on to the next methods of sampling, which are the cluster and the stratified sampling methods. These two are often confused with each other. Now with cluster sampling, you're randomly selecting groups of people to study. For example, we're gonna break a city into 1000 precincts and you're gonna randomly choose 15 to 25 of them and sample, and I've covered over the word all, all people within these precincts get sampled. Now on my next screen, I have a picture of the high desert of Southern California in the Victorville area. And I don't think I have a thousand squares here, but what I've done is I've placed a grid system over the high desert. And I'm gonna pretend I'm gonna stand way, way back with a dart and I'm not a good dart thrower. And I'm gonna throw darts at this. This is as best as I can do for my random selection to choose certain neighborhoods to sample. Now, some of the neighborhoods are rather populous, such as ones that are near Spring Valley Lake. And if we choose them, there's a lot of houses and people to go to, and we have to survey all of them. Now, if I happen to throw a dart up here into a mountainous region outside of the cities, there might only be three or four houses out there for me to sample and it will be relatively easy to get people sampled over there. Likewise, I can see a neighborhood over here in Mojave Vista, or sorry, Baldy Mesa, a lot of homes in that neighborhood. We have the Victor Valley Mall over here and behind it, there's a lot of houses there. So these are more populous areas. And then we've got the less populous areas in various regions throughout the high desert. So not only are we randomly selecting these precincts or these rectangular grids to sample, but everybody within each of these samples needs to be counted and represented in the study. And by everybody, I might be referring to all adults, I might be referring to all Democrats, I might be referring to all college students in these neighborhoods. It just depends on what the population of interest is for that particular study. So for this cluster method or of sampling, basically I've already described it. The advantages are it's somewhat time and cost saving because once you have a particular neighborhood or area that you're going to, to do your sampling, it's just walk from one house to the next or one apartment to the next to gather the data. And that saves you time from traveling all over the place to try and access the people or items that you want to survey or study. And it is somewhat representative. See, if we go back and look at this picture, the idea is that we want to get representation from all the different areas represented on this map. And by randomly choosing groups or areas or clusters to study, we're kind of meeting that goal. But certain neighborhoods, like for example, I don't have any sampling here in Hesperia in the sample that I drew. I don't have any from Adelanto in this sample that I just drew. So there can be some drawbacks. It is somewhat representative. Now, it may or underrepresent some people or some precincts. We may get too many people who live in certain neighborhoods because they're super populated neighborhoods and the people who are just in the very sparsely populated regions just may not be as represented. It just depends. And it could be costly or time consuming, especially if we're dealing with large cities and you've got a dense population getting every single person from within each of those clusters. Now I told you that people tend to get methods three and four mixed up. The key distinction that most people like is this word all. If a description says we're sampling all people from within a precinct, that is a kind of a clue that it is the cluster method of sampling. If we are looking at stratified sampling, 
Okay, here we break the population into subcategories called strata, and then we sample from each of the strata. Now, the strata you might think of as categories. You might say, okay, I'm interested in studying the children, the teenagers, the young adults, the adults, and the senior citizens. There's a strata broken down by age. We might break the strata down by political affiliation, Republicans, Democrats, Whigs, we don't have Whigs anymore, but independents, communists, etc. Break them down. And the idea is that every one of those groups is going to be sampled from, and we're trying to make sure every group gets representation. <coughs> we mentioned a little bit ago that some groups may not be represented over with the cluster sampling. This makes up for that by May assuring each category or strata of the population is going to have some representation, but it also comes with its drawbacks. So advantages, every strata is assured representation, but the disadvantages I was referring to is it can be costly trying to get to the different people from each of the different strata. It can be time consuming and you really do need to have a knowledge of the different strata in order to be able to uh, identify those people and sample those people. And I keep saying people because that's easier for us to deal with, but they could be items um, that come off of an assembly belt, for example. Moving on, we have the systematic sampling. This is the one that's easiest to identify because every Kth member after the first is chosen from one to K. Now, what does that mean? Usually you have a phrase saying something like every 20th person we're gonna survey, every 50th person, every 100th person. And it's that TH that comes after the number that pretty much gives it away. Now, the advantage here is that it's easy to perform. You just stand somewhere, you're counting people off, and you go one, two, three, four, five, you get it, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you get it, every fifth person, and boom, it's done. Disadvantage, however, is not everyone has an equal chance of being selected. If we start with person number one, boom, they're selected. But guess what? Persons two, three, four don't get selected. Then boop, five does. And then six, seven, and eight don't. And so there isn't this equal representation, equal chance of being selected, which is so important in the random sampling method. And if you are going through, for example, the turnstile to get into a concert event and you find out that the person in front of you just won a prize and it's gonna be another hundred people before the next person gets a prize, you're not going to want to be the person behind the one getting the prize. You're going to want that hope to be able to win it if you get my adrift there. So there's a little bit of an interesting um, twist to that method. The idea is we're splitting things up throughout the, the day, throughout the, per, the population study in a somewhat fair method. But what does fair mean? OK, that's another issue here. Now, we have voluntary response sampling. This falls into a convenience sampling method that we talked about with method number two, but people are asked or solicited to volunteer their opinions on a topic. Now the advantage is, hey, the data is coming to us. We put out a call, hey, everyone who wants to give us an opinion on this particular issue, please phone in, please call in, please text something here, send us your email address. The data comes to us disadvantage is it's extremely biased. Those who have the strongest opinions are the ones most likely to respond. When we start talking about different types of biases, the voluntary response bias is right there at the top of the list. Those who have the strongest opinions want to have their voice heard because they feel strong about whatever the issue may be. So these are our six main methods of sampling that you need to be aware of and be able to distinguish between because I will give you questions to ask you to tell me which method is being illustrated. Now here are some other sampling techniques. 
we begin with double sampling. In double sampling, a large population is given a questionnaire to determine those who meet the qualifications for a study. After the questionnaires are reviewed, a second population is defined, and then a sample is selected from this group. Sometimes it's just as simple as we're going to do some pre-screening to say, okay, who have these particular attributes? If they don't have the attributes of people that we are interested in for this study, they're excluded. And then from the smaller subpopulation, we then do more sampling. And we would, could use any of those methods I've previously described on that subcategory. Multi-stage sampling, you use a, com a combination of these sampling methods. Um, as I've described just a second ago. And then we have what are called weighted surveys. And I think this is something that is being used more and more frequently um, in our polling services, in the news outlets that we're seeing that when you get an opinion, it's not just the raw data that's been re being reported, they're being weighted somehow. So what are weights? Weights are values assigned to each case in the data file to restore the proportional representation of the target population. Okay, that's kind of a loaded statement here, but let's pretend that we are trying to survey based upon ethnicity. And let's pretend that we have one subset of our population which is identified as Pacific Islanders, and they're about 1% of our population. But what if when we do our surveying, we don't get 1% of our people being Pacific Islanders? Let's say we only get half of a percent. Well, then they're not getting as much representation perhaps as they should have. So we wanna change that half percent up to a whole percent. We might give them a double weight. And then if we have another group of our population, another ethnicity that let's say is 35% of our population. And when we do our study, we just happen to go over 35% of that ethnicity, then we would weigh it down, scale it back because, hey, we got 45%, let's multiply it by a factor to drop it back to 35%. The idea here is we want to get the samples that we take to represent the makeup or composition of the population. So why do we use weights? Weights are used to make adjustments for these reasons. Members of the population sampled with varying probabilities. In other words, we've got freshmen that are sampled at a higher rate than seniors, for example. Non-response varies by characteristics. For example, women have a higher response rate or may have a higher response rate than men. And so we might want to even that out by giving a high, scaling back on the female vote and scaling up on the male response. Maybe, uh, sorry, make sample characteristics consistent with population characteristics. For example, the percent of samples by gender matches the percent of population by gender. In other words, we're going to say, ooh, our sample composition did not quite align with the population composition. And so we want to even it out, so to speak, because we're doing the best we can to represent the whole population. We don't want to give too high of a voice to one of these characteristic subcategories, and therefore we will be doing some scaling. Now, if you are going to be using this scaling or this weights, there are some considerations that you need to take. First off, weights allow the researcher to make inferences or decisions to the population from which the sample were drawn. I'm going to say, for example, what percent of the population engages in regular, regular exercise? We can use our sample to make a prediction about the population. And that's important. We're trying to um, make inferences. And so that's a good reason for us to do weights. Weights are used to make adjustments. We talked about that already in probability samples, not to fix 
poorly defined or designed samples or convenient samples. Okay. In other words, if you have poor sampling methods, if you have a sample of convenience, no matter of weighting that you may do to the data is going to make up for that. You still have to have proper sampling methods that you're dealing with. Samples must be drawn with probability methods, preferably the random sample. Your samples must be of high quality and you want a decent size. We don't want to make a prediction about the entire state of California. California based on a survey of 23 people. That just is not going to pass muster. Now, we've been using the words sample and population rather loosely. Um, I want to give you a couple of other words. The first one is statistic. A statistic is a number that describes a sample, and a parameter is a number that represents a population. Notice that statistics starts with the letter S. Statistics represent samples, so we have S and S for both of these. And then we have a parameter represents a population. Both of those start with the letter P. And I've made my own parenthetical comment here. Pay close attention to these words throughout the sentence. We will always use statistics or sample values to make predictions about population values or about parameters. That sentence that I have there in italics is going to be heard over and over from me as we go through this course. Here we have it. We use sample values to predict population values. That would be language that you prefer, but a little more precisely, instead of saying sample values, we say we use statistics, which are sample values, to make predictions about population parameters, which are values from the population. Okay, these two sentences right here, key sentences for this entire class. Let's continue on. Let's talk about different types of surveys and their advantages and disadvantages. And you've got to fill these into your notes because I've got them covered up so I can talk about them one part at a time. A personal interview survey, that's where a person physically calls you up on the phone, identifies them as being from a particular organization and asks if you have time to answer some survey questions. Advantages of these, that is where people can taste see and feel a product, that's kind of nice. And longer interviews are sometimes tolerated. I'm sorry, these are not phone calls, these are face-to-face. -face. It's kind of like you're meeting someone at Costco, they're giving you samples, here you're meeting people up instead, you get a see, taste, and just give your opinion that way. And you've got a person face-to-face -face you're working with. Disadvantages here, it, the cost per interview is much higher. You've got to pay people to do this. They need to know how to do the surveying. And going to a location can draw people who are similar to each other. If you're going to a Costco location where people are hanging out, they're all maybe of a certain type of people. If you go to a Dodger game and you sample people, they're all Dodger fans for the most part, or maybe they're from the away team, but you can see that there are similar characteristics and you're cutting down on the variety of people, you're cutting down on the randomness. Now with a telephone interview, it's fast, you can use random digit dialing. Instead of having a list of people to call, instead, you just have the computer randomly dial numbers and that's how you connect with people. And software can make complex question design more practical. Usually if you are given a telephone survey, you are asked a series of questions and the people giving the survey are reading them off of a screen. And based upon the responses that you give that they key into the computer, it might change what the follow-up question is gonna be, the next question that's being asked. And that is the complex questionnaire design. It can use the results that you are providing, the responses that you are providing to adjust and reconfigure the remaining portions of the survey. The disadvantages are 
there's a non-response rate, okay? Telemarketers have a bad name. Getting people to say, yes, I'll take 10 or 15 minutes to do a survey is difficult. And you cannot show products over a phone the way you can with a personal interview survey. Now, you can also survey people through the mail, and there are some advantages there, okay? It's very inexpensive to mass mail your surveys out. You can include pictures, and people can answer at their own convenience, which is kind of nice. Disadvantages are the time you have to wait for people to respond. It can take forever, especially if the survey sits on their kitchen table and they don't open their mail for a week. Then you also have the response rates are usually very, very small. I use the word dismal there. Now, a web page survey has quite a few advantages, and it's extremely fast. There's almost no cost involved. You don't have any stamps or postage to deal with. And it allows for picture and sound. If you want people to watch a video clip or to judge between a few different samples, which looks better, uh, that's very easy to do. Disadvantages are people can quit mid-survey. It's like, I'm getting bored. You're not keeping my attention here. Or it's taking too long. You have no control over software that, that block people and what can happen on the end. You're just putting it out there. And perhaps people could respond multiple times, which is going to introduce a bias into the situation. Now, email surveys, another way of reaching out to people. Advantages, speed, it's fast, it's easy to do. There's almost no cost and it allows for picture and sound again. But disadvantages, you need a list of email addresses to begin with and multiple responses, okay? If I get a survey in the mail and I say, hey, friend, I wanna send it to you so you can respond, we really might not have a way of checking up on that unless there's a, something that says, enter your email address to identify you. But if you're like most people who have three, four or more email addresses, then you still can have people who put in their opinion multiple times. So I've got an overall summary listed here, dealing with some of the considerations with, um, and comparisons basically between the different methods. Now, when you're looking for speed, email and web pages are fastest because people just have to click to get to them, followed by the telephone interview because people are answering the phone, but the mail surveys, those are the slowest. When you're talking about cost, personal interviews, most expensive, you've got that live time that you've got to deal with, then followed by telephone, still dealing with a person and their time, and then you've got mail. Email and web surveys are the least expensive for the largest samples. You are getting the best bang for your buck, so to speak. Internet usage, web pages and email surveys offer significant advantages but you may not be able to generalize the results to the population as a whole because you only have certain people who, darn it, I'm not, only certain people who are able to get to your web page or know about the survey that you're giving. Literacy or reading levels, illiterate and less educated people rarely respond to mail surveys. They prefer the spoken instead. If you have sensitive questions that you need to ask, most people are more likely to answer sensitive questions when interviewed directly by a computer. They don't want to answer private questions to a live person in a survey. And as far as video sound and graphics, a need to get reactions to video, music, or pictures limits the options that you have. You can play sounds in a phone interview, but you can only display pictures in a mail survey. So there's a lot of considerations that go on when you are trying to determine which method of surveying is the type that you want to go with. Now in our next video, we will move in and start talking about data and the different types of data that we study.